when I started putting this together, it's you know they have those shopping things where you realize time's gone by really, really fast. <laughs> so I'm going to talk. Uh, so I was going to talk about a project which now I realize is over a decade old. So um, and I thought actually that's some time which we can reflect on that project and sort of think about other things that could come on afterwards. Um, so um, I want to start just with some questions. Um, this is about digitization. I'm going to talk about digitization. I want to sort of stand back and think, well, what, why are we digitizing at all? Um, and there's some possible reasons, you know, and, and the I'll put at the top because you can. And this seems to be one of the reasons why most people started at least digitizing because they had some kit, they could do something. Um, but also we can think about a digital backup, we can think about increasing access, um, whether or not that access is for as online museums. The idea is a 24 hour museum, so which anybody can access anytime from anywhere. Um, but also ease of research. Now, so I've got a picture up on the right, the Portland Antiquity Scheme, which is run from the British Museum. Um, it's mostly metal detector based database. Um, but because it's online, and because it's digital, and it consists normally of photographs and, and some description, then it gets a huge amount of use by students, by researchers. And when you start comparing those numbers, it's a bit false because we talk about a national thing compared to regional museums, but you start looking at museum use against the collections compared to the digital, you start to get a sense of um, this idea of ease of research being really quite significant. We might also think about things like economics, you know, the idea that if you can, you can print on demand. I'm not going to talk about that, but yeah, there's other reasons why you might think about this sort of thing, although there might be specific research driven needs, and I'll come on to that in a bit, where something's very specific, so therefore your visualization is slightly different. But whatever you're doing, this dictates to some extent what method you should use. Are you going to look at it from 2D? Which is what most digitization is, you can do it 3D or something else. Um, what sort of catalog information do you need with it as well? So, what's yeah, this beyond metadata, you know, what does the actual database need to be? So, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start off with the very old project. Uh, this just funded Eat Myers um, Virtual Museum project. And then I'm going to sort of reflect on that a little bit by thinking about users, particularly with um, uh, a group you have here called Digital Humanity Hub. And then I'm going to sort of think a bit more about creativity in terms of how we present to those users or some of these users in terms of a, a project which I ran a few years ago as well. So our starting point, two starting points, one of those is online collections. Okay, there's one from the British Museum, the idea of a collection, you know, some a text, image, you know, normal sort of information on the one side. And then the other side, very old, probably one of the first 3D collections um, from the Hampson Museum, the University of Arkansas. Of, of 3D objects. The idea you could download, you could interact with the 3D objects, you know, really quite exciting, um, particularly back in, back in the state. Oh, there we go. Right, so with that as a sort of a context, let's go to Eat Myers. Um, and I suspect most of you are aware of um, Myers himself um, from the British Army. He collected a huge amount of uh, primarily Egyptian material culture um, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, Probably around about 1300 objects. It's one of those normal problems of you know, exactly how many and how you might count it, but around about 1300 objects. He died in 1899 and he bequeathed the collection to his school, uh, Eaton College, and the Eaton Mars collection. Um, and it was subsequently supplemented by other collections. So it's probably around about 3000 objects there, uh, somewhere along the line. And the collection was incredibly well known. Well, some of the objects were incredibly well known. They did the tour. Um, in, uh, the uh, New York Met and so on, in terms of um, where they appeared. But the problem is most of the collection was hidden away within a loft in Eaton College. So actually it wasn't very well used. So one of the big challenges and the big questions for starting is how do you actually access, you know, how can you make a collection like that accessible? Um, now part of the collection's on campus, the other half is John, Johns Hopkins, or part of it's there. Um, they're just some of the objects. Not all, as you can tell, it's not all Egyptian. So the particular Things we wanted to do was to facilitate universal access, as we like to call it. Now, that's not strictly true, is it? You think about digital literacy and accessibility, but anyway, facilitate this universal access to uh, reflection. Do it in 3D rather than 2D, because we thought you, know, you, can have, you can do more things, you can measure things, you can, you can interact. And it seemed like a great thing after we'd seen the University of Arkansas work. Um, but also, then think about well, how, what do you do with it in the future? So, we have this project, the, the scan was done by Helen Molden, and I think it's now the MASH phone. <laughs> Um, and uh, Martin Bobbis, who um, I yeah, can't say that, um, did the cataloging. So the actual idea of, of putting the Egyptological material together. And one of the things I'll say now, before, before I forget, is that actually they ended up using the digital objects more than the physical objects within the catalog, which I think is a really interesting 
maybe it points back to the Port of Antiquities point early on. So the method we use with laser scanning, um, using a variety of two scanners, two different scanners for different resolutions and so on. But actually even then, that is still creates issues and it doesn't actually help us entirely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through very quickly about a million slides, give or take, um, of different materials and, and some, of the, some of the results from this. But as I go through, I'm going to highlight some of the, I'm, I'm going to focus primarily actually on the problems rather than anything else. Because, you know, the, the, the advantage is if you get a beautiful 3D model, you know, we can sort of see, you can measure things, you can, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do with that. Um, you can change the lighting on it so you can see other surface details, that kind of stuff. But I want to look at some of the problems. So wood spray, wood scans really, really well, um, you know, because it's not reflective. So if you know anything about laser scanning, but a reflective surface, the laser bounce off and goes the wrong way. And so you end up with a poor model. We'll see some of those in a minute. Um, things like ceramics work very well as well. Uh, and just to highlight that one of the beauties of this sort of scanning is that you actually get the form of the object as well as the texture. So you can, you, in terms of analysis, you can actually remove the texture, which some objects that have been painted over or, or something else, it's actually useful to see the form. Particularly, you know, some, uh, something sort of uh, made in, sort of manufactured in en masse, and then the detail is added through painting. So you can actually look at those two in, in contrast. So what you're seeing here is basically with texture and without texture um, in each case. Yeah, so just running through things, you know, plaster works really, really nicely. And that's a great example where removing the texture is quite, quite handy. Um, now, generally faience, depending on how much faience there is, works quite well. Um, you know, if it's too shiny, it doesn't work. But the reason for sort of highlighting these, you've got text going right around the object. And this is where the photography is. You know, this is where we were thinking, well, 3D is great because you can rotate it. You can actually read it. Um, now, many of the texts are kind of saying the same thing. Uh, not always, which is another example of another, another faience strategy. Um, that ability to be able to sort of rotate things and, and look under them and, and so on. Even scanning things like the catalogue numbering and that kind of thing on objects, it's great. Metal, well, it depends how shiny it is really. But I want to highlight this example, that's all finished about that tool. Um, and you'll notice also there's another issue, there's no scales on any of these. Um, but if you look at the writing here, it's actually quite vague. And the problem is, even with the, using two different scanners and different resolutions, when you get a small object, you're, only, you're naturally going to be bouncing fewer points off of it, even if it's every half millimetre. Um, so therefore, the smaller the object, the fewer the points, therefore, the, you know, the less detail. And we get the same thing in terms of this little thought figure. Um, if you sort of look, look on the exact detail, it's not that great. You are not seeing as much detail as we might like to. Nowadays, you'd probably approach that using some like photography, photogrammetry, something like that, to it through the object. Stone. Now, one of the nice things as well about scanning is that it's not just recording the objects or the, you know, the three dimensions, it's also recording the intensity of the reflection. So um, if you're hitting text, even if it's very, very slight, you've got another example of something slight, um, you can sometimes get a difference, it will brace up the, the laser signals to get a difference in the intensity. So even when you can't see it on the object, you can sometimes see it through the intensity of reflection. It's quite handy. Yeah, that one. So the text is very slight on that object. But reflective surfaces, as sort of mentioned earlier, are really problematic. There's a beautiful, very smooth alabaster jar. But when you look at this, you can see some surface artifacts emerging because of the way the lasers interact with the shiny surface. And the same sort of thing goes for um, this object as well, the like statue. So again, that, you know, that, that reflect, highly reflective surface is awkward, but not always. You know, I just love this piece. Um, small, small tile. Also, I love that one. And yeah, you can't have a talk without that one. Just did some, um, yeah, just beautiful object. But again, yeah, it works very, very nicely for some of these objects better than others. And for some instances, it's one of the one of the portraits. Um, actually, laser scanning a flat object is sometimes quite valuable because you can see the actual yeah, the, the method in terms of the paintwork. You can also see things like inscriptions on the wood before one of them marking it out on wax before the actual painting happens. So what end, what, how did that end up? Well, it ends up going into the usual catalogue, Mimsy catalogue in this case. So you end up with a lot of objects. And then you've got a problem because actually, when you look at these catalogues, you know, this is like the British Museum, this is what they look like. And you get, end up with your, your photo. You can't embed your 3D interactive model into it. Now you could, there's all sorts of ways, but then you've got issues about you know, downloading plugins and all the rest of it. So um, we, we decided with this to actually just have a downloadable series of 3D models and downloadable free software 
in order to interact with them. So what you ended up with was something like that. So it allows you to um, you know, rotate, measure, um, do whatever you like really with, with those objects once you download. Although they don't get used to keep because they're not immediately obvious and not immediately interactive. You, know, it's not, you have to actually know what you're doing before you start. So therefore you can't measure the potential. You kind of need to know the potential before you do it, but you don't do it yet. Yeah, you know where I'm going. Because we're thinking all sorts of potentials. We're thinking about haptics. We exper experimented with this, the idea of you know, particularly for partial sighted touching objects virtually, particularly for really fragile objects. And we're also looking at you know, the, what has actually happened is this sort of 3D printing as well as many of these objects. Typically things like that, which you know, is so fragile, you're not going to handle that. So we're really excited. This was move on to the second bit is we, we thought, well, this is great. If you can actually scan all the objects in a collection, think about all the things which aren't on display. You could put them all on display, but virtually through a screen. You know, brilliant. We solved the world's problems. Kind of, yeah. um, but uh, so with that, we thought, well, you can have access to these objects any way you like, any time of year, you know, wherever you are. So that was one of the goals we had with um, European Regional Development Fund funded humanity stuff, where, where we, we were creating interfaces for cultural organisations to, um, to effectively put collections, you know, interactive for, for collections. The downside was that whilst we were thinking, this is great, we can liberate the archive, what actually happened was it was all about curation. And I don't know if that's going to be a surprise to here, um, but yeah, from our you know, non-museological background, this sort of Realise that actually people don't want a big screen full of thousands of objects. What they want is actually something curated and presented as a story. So that was one of one of the one of the challenges we found. And um, other things which were important were actually saying rather than just giving a load of collection, actually think about how people interact with it. So user testing, understanding how people engage in museum spaces, and that's just one of the types of reasons I mentioned at the beginning in terms of why digitise. The other reason. Well, one of them on there was the idea of bespoke digitization. I'm sure it will. Yeah, so, we started off thinking that the Absolutely. if you digitize everything, then that's good for everybody forever. That's, that's great. But of course, it's not. So, this is a great case in point. This is some work by Andrew Lewis, who's a PhD student in the time. He was looking at refitting fragments of Canaveral tablets you know, and trying to do that sort of, um, automated, in an automated way. So, you have fragments from one collection, fragments from another collection, you can bring them together. Um, and this sort of work is still going on in that area. But, but the actual needs of digitization are different than if you're just trying to present something or just trying to, um, you know, just in terms of public consumption, if you like. So different needs require different approaches, different types of resolution, and so on. Which brings me to my final bit. That if you think about users and audiences, so let's go back into some broader audiences. We run a project which was thinking about, well, how do you create the best context for, for you, you know, how, how do you create the best possible thing? Now, we, we're aware of the whole needs for you know, the, the, what is now sort of almost a stock crazy cross sector collaboration, all that sort of thing. But actually, the reality of it, we wanted to look at. So, this was uh, work we actually ended up, uh, David Hope was doing a PhD on it at the time. Uh, so, working with creative industries as well as curators and just sort of seeing, particularly what we're measuring was actually how do people talk about collections. So, the actual title, Cops and Robbers, Cops was communities of practice. So, how, you know, language is different depending on what you do. And think about how people respond to both digital objects and, and, uh, and physical objects in terms of creativity in the language they use. And what we did to analyze that was use Kolb's learning cycle, which is quite old but um, useful. Um, so this idea of trying to map different sorts of language use across, across that, you've probably seen this sort of before, I'm sure. Um, but what we're interested in is the idea of problem solving so down this, this, this end and the creative at, at, the, at the top. So if we just look at the digital creatives, you know, people who are creating content, often being commissioned by museums to, to do that sort, of, that sort of work. What we found was when they were using physical artifacts, we're talking about using uh, physical artifacts, they, they were, you know, they, they had all the imagination in the world. They had some great ideas and things which were frankly quite terrifying to a lot of curators because they think, you break stuff. But, um, but yeah, they had, they had all the really, really crazy ideas. In contrast, when they, bear in mind they are used to working with digital, when they worked with, when they were working with digital objects, they're all down in the old problem solving ones. They're all the right method. And what we concluded from this was that the idea of thinking outside the box, it's really easy to think outside the box if you don't know there's a box. And the whole thing about communities and practice is you learn what the box is. So if we want to have a justification, data like this is really handy in terms of why we should be working from the starting point of any project in terms of, sort of cross sector work, 
not just because people do different things, but also think differently. So what have we learned? Some final thoughts from um, So I think conceptually, this again is not a surprise, it's all about audience, isn't it? And that audience isn't the same. And I know we know it's not the same, but uh, some of you requiring bes uh, bespoke research visualization is very different to different audience. Um, we, we need to be, you know, you to think the idea for early cross-sector uh, cross conversation and think about both the content you produce, but also how people interact with that content. If you consider just having it there, you know, build it, they will come. Didn't work. You know, we, we didn't, people would not download things. And technically, the idea that, you know, one method is not suitable for everybody. Sometimes a photograph's much better than 3D. Um, it depends what you're trying to do. So this idea, I think, which is quite antiquated now, I think, you know, we can just do, this is the best technology, therefore it will be right for everybody. It just doesn't work. Um, and redundancy of interfaces, obviously, in terms of however you do this, you have to think about long-term planning, um, as well as the longevity of the objects themselves in your digital, digital uh, service. Um, the different levels of digitization for different requirements. So I'm going to stop there, sort of, so from a very old project and through a load of other things, um, hopefully that's been useful. Thank you.